I'm really here to get the best out of Elizabeth um, and try and sort of navigate this incredibly exciting space. Um, a couple of sort of meta points. One is that what I love about this series or the previous ones um, is they bring art and science together and I really do believe that the best scientists are artists and the best artists are also scientists. So I think we sometimes forget that. Um, also, I was kind of a little bit afraid of this encounter because I'm the opposite of brave. <laughs> um, I'm afraid of heights. I can't parallel park. Um, I... Uh, you know, I, I don't take risks um, other than things that I say. Um, <coughs> uh, and, and, and also, we both, it, and I, it, it's, we haven't met before, but I absolutely believe that we simultaneously, and I've said this before, obsess about movement and forget about movement. We think it's central, and I've talked about this before, <coughs> half the population of the world watch the World Cup final half the population. Right? Um, we love car chases, kung fu movies, trapeze artists. We, we, we love to watch dangerous movement. Um, I also completely agree that there was a time where, where did movement come from? I personally believe that we move because we either hunted or we were hunted. So it was a nasty proposition from the very beginning. Right? <laughs> Um, and we've kind of forgotten that it was about that, and we've sort of become sort of flaccid, sedentary kind of movers. And that's why we watch athletes, because they do the dangerous movement for us, right? We can watch it. And I think, Elizabeth, what you're doing is you're taking that thing that we've kind of diluted and forgotten about, and distilled it to its crystalline essence and dangerousness and brought it back. Uh, and I was just wondering um, <clears throat> whether you can say something about when you first really knew that movement in its verticality had to be made horizontal and, and dangerous again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was um, when I wondered why technical dance, when you're training as a dancer, uh, was so time consuming. And when it occurred to me that all of the technical issues with the feet and the legs and the operation of the arms, which are mostly qualitative, bottom of your body is pretty force-based and also it has to bear the weight of the top half of your body. And I was thinking, 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 your only base of support is the bottoms of your feet. And if you're only in vertical space, uh, you're ignoring space really because we think that if both feet aren't off the ground, you're not really moving, because you do not have to. And what was left out is landing, or just making a decision to not camouflage gravity. And once you do that, uh, all hell breaks loose, basically. And it becomes, it becomes completely, I was riveted at the point when I realized if you're in a push-up position, I just thought, well, let me feel what the impact feels like. If you have a full-on body hit, so you're in a push-up, you can all try this at home, by the way. <laughs> you're in a push, perfect push-up position. Your body is a perfect line. That's, those are two incredible things. I mean, you must do those. And then you somehow make yourself release your arms all at once. And you go, wham. You're only a foot from the ground. And the hit was so alarmingly hard that I just got up, smiled, went out, and wanted to tell a wee stranger how exciting what I just discovered was. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's also interesting because as a neurologist, you know, for over 20 years, I've been looking after people uh, with disease of the nervous system and brain injury, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, where, you know, it's a big surprise, I think, for most people to realize how little speed in a car or how small a fall can cause serious injury. And in the elderly, falling is a major cause of morbidity and mortality, right? And walking is a kind of falling, right, in a way. Um, so the idea of sort of realizing how close to damage you always are, right? And, and, and then you say, I'm gonna turn that up to 11, basically. <laughs> Or 55. Um, oh, 55. So, um, 
So there's a, this notion, I think you probably know it, of the limit experience, I think it was originally French, which is an experience or an action of such intensity and near impossibility that it brings you to the sort of edge of living, right? And uh, Foucault talked about this, right? This sort of doing edge work. Do, do you believe that, and even in the video, that being at the edge of living, sort of being in touch with danger through movement, is kind of philosophically more exhilarating and true than ordinary life? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So can you just sort of elaborate on that? I mean, does it make you deeper? <laughs> oh, I absolutely do. And um, I think in terms of if you listed the discoveries of Streb, you know, usually that's looking back. And we are completely focused on the present tense. And um, it also is adjacent to the notion that one time I asked the physicist Lisa Randall, mm -hmm. would you please define time for me? Because space is a little more present. There it is although dance ignores space, but separate from that. Um, what's time? And she said, well, it's it. And she went into kind of a slight short paragraph about physics and um, equations. And she said, well, actually, in the end, there's a problem with the minus sign. And I thought that was one of the most beautiful sentences, meaning they, I don't think they have figured out what time is. But for, but for us, if you, end up, if you end up thinking that when you're in control, like the idea of the edge. When you're in control, um, you're really not doing anything. It's when you somehow figure out how to um, con construct a force field, and Streb does that through our, through our equipments, or falling from 30 feet, which I don't recommend any of you do. Um, then you find out what your limits are. And I think, I think that until you, uh, until you, and we, how do you say, until you get to the place where you can set up a situation, which I started to do fairly early on, that when you enter it in, into it, you don't know where you are. And the skill level has to be, but you can contend with it on some level until gravity grabs you back to the ground. And I think that I had to early on start to decide that danger, not just danger, but injury, that we would get a little hurt. And then I really had another just um, overlap epiphany, realizing, oh, dancers mostly spend all their technical time uh, not, not, not worrying about their body, therefore not going to the edge, not even close to the edge. And I think, you know, we, we do have a reputation of being pretty brutal. Yes, we, yes. I've noticed. I don't know. <laughs> but, I, but I think that within that um, perceptual brutality, is the content of action. It is about that half second. It's not about representing something else or indicating um, a story. So it's... Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, I was reading about some of the reviewers who are less than sympathetic of your work, thinking, you know, it's just gimmicks and it's just dangerous, right? Yeah. But it's interesting to me, I was thinking about that because, you know, I find watching The Walking Dead or, the you know, Breaking Dead. Bad, you know, these TV shows, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. extremely yeah. harrowing, you know? I'm sort of, <laughs> marinating in my stress hormones <laughs> watching them, right? And yet, it's interesting that people feel now that if they're going to watch a TV show, it has to be at the edge of life. It can't just be about a teacher who may be dying of cancer. No, they have to become a murderous, psychopathic <laughs> drug lord, right? Why? Why is it that we believe that the real psychological depths come out when people are put through savage extremes? And we accept that in our TV watching, right? Yeah. Um, but when it comes to doing it in the dance realm, when it's physical, the physical version of Breaking Bad, people go, wow, I don't know if I want to watch that, right? But have you found that there's just two camps, people who will want to watch it and others who don't, or do people get better at watching without flinching? <laughs> Well, we want everything in your body to flinch when you watch what we do. I think that would be the natural response. But ironically, I think if you took that whole quanta of how many people watch the World Cup, half the world, if I could have a distribution system where what Streb does goes into the real world, but you have to strip the stain of art off of it, um, it would be half the world would want to do this. People relate to what they remember, whether it's 
you know, mowed lawn when they were a child, their mother's perfume. It's all sensorial and experiential. The stain of art. I, I consider, I'm enveloped in the stain of art. Could you just, that's, that's fantastic. I'm especially in a museum filled with art objects. <laughs> so um, w w what do you mean by the stain of art? Well, I think, you know, the reason why we only probably have gotten one great review from the New York Times, which was in 1981, <laughs> um, <laughs> is it's upsetting and I think that I, I started as a very working, adopted working class family kid that rode motorcycles, downhill ski, did baseball, basketball, and really felt like the exciting part of a moment is when you don't know what's gonna happen next. And the art world and the movement world, which is dance, is the opposite of that. Everybody knows what's gonna happen. And you all have to admit when you go to a dance concert, it is the most boring thing in the world. <laughs> I mean, you, you know what's going to happen. Okay, well, that's, that's you know, I'm, I'm experimenting with what is a real move and that requires danger and how do you construct the present tense in such a way that it's present tense, present tense, present tense, present tense, and then it's over. And I really think that probably um, the duration problem, like our shows could be five minutes and I would get everything I need in there and you could go home. So I think that I'm, um, I'm I mean, I'm, I don't think I've come to any conclusions. I think I'm still experimenting with the notion of how do you, how do you well, what's the iambic pentameter of action? Mm -hmm. Just like what's actually the physical length of duration that a comment or a sentence, but certainly a move has to be for you to notice it. And then also, what is, um, you know, what, is, what is the present tense? What is now? And that ends up being you know, a constant confusion for me. And sometimes it may be, you know, when I was watching the videos, um, you probably know this whole thing that happened when Julie Taymor, who did The Lion King, did Spider-Man, right? Yeah. And yeah. swinging, and there were injuries, yes, and it was yeah. too dangerous, and I the whole know. thing sort of became a bit of a fiasco. But I would have imagined you thought the possibility of Spider-Man falling to his death would have been the best part of it, <laughs> right? Um, but but, it, <laughs> but it, it was like they overstrebbed Spider-Man, right? Well, and they actually, <coughs> uh, as you know, it closed. I do. I did hear that. Yeah, yeah. I heard it closed. But you know, I, I saw the preview, you know, with my partner Laura Flanders before it was ever opened, and um, they just didn't set aside enough time for flying. Right. And they had nine degrees of freedom in that Green Goblin. So that meant that there were 85 people in the basement on their computers assessing when one line goes shorter and you know, the, other, the other eight have to adjust lengthwise as well. So that Green Goblin could go like this. And so they could do the everywhere traveling from the stage up to the balcony. But my biggest complaint about that was they never land. It, they did land when the cable broke or the mechanics. <laughs> I did not see that. But I really think that circus, um, you know, all of, the, all of the wild actions of Broadway that are, you know, even Peter Pan, he just swings around, she just swings around. And because they never land, that fly, that's not flight. Flight is not eternal. There's got to be an end to it, and it's a brutal end. And so we're developing techniques to contend with what happens in that moment when you land, the failure of flight. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really interesting, uh, you know, the, when I was reading that New Yorker article about you, um, I think I mentioned to you before we came on that I, I'm a big J.G. Ballard fan who did Crash and other such things, and Crash, you know, was this novel in, written in 1973, and when it was sent to publishers, one wrote, this author is beyond psychiatric help. <laughs> uh, do not publish. Right, yeah, uh-huh. And, and he <laughs> was very much interested in sort of the implicit death drive in all driving. That driving is at about high-speed machines, which I know you're very interested in since you were a motorcycle, and mm -hmm. the possibility of impact and death in yeah. high-speed high machines. And in fact, at some point, Ballard said that, that Thanatos is not implicit in driving, Driving is death, right? <laughs> and, and, and so people were appalled by his taking that to the extreme of cars are their halting and their crashing. And, and, and it seemed to me in a way this sort of 
severity of crash and taking cars to the, and machines to their ultimate limit is what you're also doing in terms of thinking about the interaction between machines and movement. Well, I think I'm, I am, that's exactly what I'm doing. And, and what you try and do is step back from that last millisecond when the Pre-crash. Pre-crash, I mean, but you don't know where the limit is. I mean, it's said that every time you get on your motorcycle, I started when I was 15 and stopped when I was 24, after I drove my Honda 350 6,000 miles in 30 days to San Francisco from Rochester, New York. And I knew that every time I got back on, it, it was just a, a legend or a, you know, the, the fact of the matter with motorcycles, you're one step closer to your bad crash. And I think that I have absorbed every injury that's ever happened in Streb, at Streb. It is, I think I even have PTSD. Um, and my job is to be this fraction of a second um, before that happens but it's just a discovery process. And I mean, the most extreme example of that, if I may say, I, I don't know if any of you have seen, I recommend it if you haven't, the movie, Alex Honnold's movie, Free Solo. I saw, I saw, yeah. And you know, that's what you just said. That's crazy. Distilled to its essence. In other words, here is someone who's decided uh, to climb Free Solo up El Capitan. It's uh, three, four, five thousand feet, takes three hours. Three. Uh, they, torture you when you watch this movie by watching him practice on ropes oh. and he keeps slipping off of those oh, key right moments yeah. and then they he decides to free solo it he just has that moment he decides and it's exactly what you're saying he basically in those three and a half hours every single second is instant death and also completely planned out because i think he we're going to get to that okay. that, that, that okay. practice bit i think is fantastic i want to ask you all about that right <laughs> which is exactly yeah. that which is that but nevertheless, I, found, I, I thought I was extraordinarily brave watching it. Because <laughs> um, I was heart, literally... Your like, heart. Yes, right. <laughs> and and you know, it's a little bit like a no, flight like simulator. This. I mean, you, think, you see pilots in flight simulators and they're sweating and you go, it's a flight simulator right. <laughs> on the ground. Right? But it doesn't help even knowing that they wouldn't have made this movie had he fallen off. Right, so I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying to myself, well, they would have made, made it. it. They, would they have probably would have made it, but they wouldn't have released it. Yes, because the cameraman, there's one cameraman going like this. He's not watching. He's just <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right. But, um, but anyway, it, it, it's exactly that. that and, and then they ask him, what is happening to you knowing you're at that edge? Mm -hmm. no. You know, paradoxically, you're never more alive knowing that you may, in a second, not be. Right? Yeah. Um, but practice. Okay, the, one of the, the, the profound thing in that movie, which I don't actually think gets that much comment, my is what you sweaty. said, which is my what you're saying, <laughs> is um, he noted, he had notebooks. And in those notebooks, he was actually noting down positions of every part of his body. In other words, his view of his body was far more fine-grained and understood. In other words, he wasn't just doing a slightly amped up version of when we go on a climbing wall. He was doing something completely different, right? And I think that's what people don't understand is true about the brain and practice, mm -hmm. is when you get really good, you're not just doing a slight, a, a better version of what we all do. You're, you're somewhere else, right? And I was just wondering, can you practice not to be afraid? Well, no to that. Fear is a necessary element of surviving. That kind because they of put him, I mean, as you remember in that movie, they put him in a brain scanner. They put... Alex Honnold in an MRI scanner, and they showed him, I don't know, stills from Breaking Bad and The Walking Dead or something like that, and they were looking at how much he modulated activation of his amygdala, you know, the so-called fear center, and he had a much decreased dynamic range. In other words, he wasn't moved by this horror very much. Now, of course, what one can infer from that in terms of whether he just, for a given horrific thing, he was just a little less frightened. I mean, does that make sense? Do you think that you're just going to, yes, you have fear, but you're not as afraid for things that maybe I would be, like the gain on it has gone down. Well, well I think, I mean, to quote Philippe Petit, um, you, he, he would say when asked, this was in a New York article years ago, um, are you afraid for your life up there on that wire when you walked across the World Trade Towers at that time in 1974? He goes, yes. I fear for my life, but it's a detail. And I think that that's a beautiful mm. difference. I mean, Alex was completely prepared 
he'd done it, I, I thought it was 10 years, but maybe it was fewer than that, but I mean, doing, so, and I had, we had honored um, Dean Potter, who, who was a predecessor to Alex, um, but was also just set records, climbing El Capitan, not free solo, but in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And you know how when, if I switch this to, Ro when Roger Barrister, everybody thought, it's a mindset, I'm going to say, everyone thought that no one could break the four minute mile. Yes. And then when he did, I think it was in 1954, um, no one could believe the body was capable yeah. of it. And it was probably a biological assessment at that time. Bodies can't go that fast. And then in 1966, someone had shaved eight seconds off of it and onward to the point where there was, I think, over a minute shaved off of it. But they, they were talking about these sets of information, these blocks of knowing where you believe something's impossible. And so you don't try as hard. And I think everybody would say, somebody, anyway, when I, when I went to meet Dean Potter and we were gonna honor him uh, at our Action Maverick Gala, two days before, he also free soloed, you know, not free soloed, but um, sky dove with these um, angel suits. Yeah. And you, 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 you base jump off, um, I think it was Yosemite, and in, in Yosemite, and uh, when you, f he went with a friend and he, 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 you hit speeds of 130 miles an hour just off the cliff. And he made an incorrect, you know, millisecond adjustment and whammed, as his friend did, into the clip, died. And then the next year I went to Telluride to be a judge on all the mountain films. And there were two mountain maniacs guys next to me doing it, three people judging these films. And by the end of those 18 films, I came to the conclusion that ultimately if they don't stop, like I'm interested in what, how can Alex up that. Um, if they don't stop, you, you will die, like the motorcycle ride comparison. Like, and I guess I clearly am trying to avoid that. Um, enough for myself, but now for my 10 dancers, my precious animals that are willing to be curious about this investigation. But I think it's, and the other part of that is, I think it's an invention of new vocabulary. Once you invent either a new machine or a new vocabulary, um, it can rise to heights that an idea you might have had years before cannot achieve. So you say, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it, oh, that's not possible. Like falling for th from 30 feet, free fall. We can do that if we land on a one foot mat. But it's an abrupt and brutal stop. But then the advantage is it's such an intense hit that if you really just start getting up before you land, you're running off the mat and no one even notices you landed. Like, what's that? Don't try that either. <laughs> but, but do you know what I mean? No, I, I do, I do. Inside, I mean, you must have the same thing, John. Inside, you were, when you talked about, because I tried, I tried to read one of your books and I, I didn't fully <laughs> succeed. Yes, you see, that was very brave. <laughs> but, but you would say, of course, we ground our positions on empirical observation, which I think we do too. But then you say, uh, technology will only be useful if it addresses being on the other side of biology. It can't, it, it has to be subordinate to biology. Yes. So in a way, isn't it sort of the same thing? Even though your technology, I make, you know, prototypic machines that we break. Your technology... is trying to fix the people you break. <laughs> 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 yeah. I thought we were friends. <laughs> So actually, it's interesting that um, at the Santa Fe Institute um, that my brother runs, there's been a meeting which we, I am absolutely going to have you come to, which is to. called "Human." It's called the Limits of Performance, and it's exactly addressing what you're saying, which is, are there any, right? And and one of the things that came up, you might not know this, but when you get fatigued in the gym, right? There's a very interesting phenomenon, um, and that's why I have a trainer because otherwise. <laughs> you know, you have to do 10 push-ups. And, you know, if you do it on your own, you get to eight. You go, eight, <laughs> eight's you pretty good, yeah. right? That's enough. That's, uh, enough. that's enough, right? But if you do 10, push-ups, 9 and 10, hurt. But if you're told to do 15 push-ups, push-ups, 9 and 10, don't hurt as much because they're not close to the end of the number of push-ups. And this has led to this mystery about where does effort come from? Is it lactic acid buildup in muscles? Is it true limit? Or is it a mental sense that I'm coming to the end of the count? Right? And it's actually the latter. Right? That you, 
fatigue and stop way before your ex external physiology requires it. So that therefore means that somehow there's a way to break through that I'm fatigued when in fact you're not really at your physical limit. Do you think there's something like that in the, in, in, in the way you train your dancers that they just don't think, I can't, you said in your, I can't fall backwards, I just cannot fall backwards. You said weeks like, okay, I'm gonna fall backwards. Well, right? And well, then suddenly you do. Well, I saw a piece of plywood do it and it seemed like... <laughs> it was just this technical thing of increasing your base of support. But to your last point, um, we, we, I started early saying, well, yeah, you get to the ninth push-up or the 14th push-up, it hurts, I'm going to stop. And your mind signals that. It's mostly the mind. Yeah, I it think. is. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. then we said we need to redefine uh, the word pain. And we're going to say, uh, we don't use the word pain we use, it's another rather interesting foreign sensation. And then you develop an appetite for a sensation, you name it, and it's not your marker to stop, because what, well, you're not strong enough, you don't want to get stronger, of course not. And I really love that, because really then there are no limits to what you're willing to put yourself through. There's a wonderful line from the um, literary critic Terry Castle, who's at Berkeley, and she wrote a wonderful set of memoirs and essays called The Mad Professor. And the line that made me laugh the most, she says, what must it be like to be stepped on when you're a cockroach? And she, <laughs> says, and she says, it must just for a second be like a very intense massage. <laughs> <laughs> Can she enter into the mind of a cockroach? Yes. I've noticed stepping on cockroaches does not kill them. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, you have to yeah. grind your yeah. heel into yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, a longer massage. That's beautiful. Yeah, isn't it great, though? Yeah, um, really So, great. talking about that, so how do you... I, I was very interested in, in how you pick your dancers. I mean, getting to the issue of talent versus attitude. And, you, and I think... I mean, I knew, actually, that I would not be picked, well, first, because of my extreme cowardice, and second, because you don't like people who talk too much, right? Isn't that one of the things that immediately just qualifies them? It does bother me, yes. <laughs> So, <laughs> so can you um, say a little bit about how they get picked, wh why they want to do this, and how you train them? It's just it's interesting. Um, and we just had auditions last week, I think, or maybe it was the week before. Um, I think that I look for when someone starts to move, when someone starts to move, they become transformed. And this is not a choice they can make. It's just that movement takes its hold on them and they turn into some form of a wild animal. And I mean a dangerous wild animal. Women have a much harder time doing this. And I think it's just, you know, you gotta swat all that training out of your body because young girls that start at six or seven, I also have a class analysis of that. They have the privilege of doing that. Mm. And that's why I think dance or modern dance uh, is performing privilege, you know, and not really sleeping beauty. Anyway, um, I think that I look for um, that, that wildness, you know, and they're not like glancing at me to see if I prove, oh, mm -hmm. am I a good dancer? I, I just want you to be a wild animal. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am guilty of choosing the most untrained bodies in the room, and my dancers have to go, Elizabeth, but they can't move. I go, but look at them, look at that face. Um, and so we, it ends up being that, you know, their passion for movement that they can't quell when they start to move. And we, we uh, I want, you know, I want, I want my stage to represent the world. So, you know, it is a problem that modern dance is pretty peopled with white people. So I, I don't, I, I work very hard at, you know, making um, the world. So we share that, I think. We yeah. don't have time for white people. I don't have. <laughs> yes. They're just not quite as interesting. <laughs> Sorry, white people. Um, so just so, but one more thing, I wait, we do three days usually, and if you come back on the th and then you self-eliminate, this isn't for me, this isn't for me. Sometimes someone who's perfect says it's not for me, and then we argue with them. Yes, it is. <laughs> You're going to wake up in the morning and just not be able to not do a backfall or a slam. Or, uh, anyway, it's, it's, a tr it's probably a tricky process, but they need to be constitutionally impervious to any chronic injury. I leave that to me. They, I see. They have to be a member of the Avengers. Yes. I see. Yeah, I, nothing, I, you don't get hurt. You don't mind getting hurt. Mm -hmm. and, and, what, and so what about the training? I mean, do you, I mean, I was watching, you know, that bar swinging and it was, to, to, you know. The, the eye beam? The eye beam. Yeah. So <clears throat> what do you do? You have a slightly soft eye beam to begin with? No. <laughs> no, John. No. <laughs> so, it's a, so it's a lethal eye beam to, to no. begin with. Oh, yeah. 
Great, great. Um, <laughs> so, um, so how do you... Do, I'm just interested in the training and the, the skilling up. How, how does that... Um, well, the, there's a pop action technique, and you basically start here on the bottoms of your feet, and you cannot move if someone gives you a huge shove, so you're grounding, you're kind of shin deep in the ground, you're really hanging on to it. And then we start by spatial awareness, pivots of a quarter, an eighth, a half, uh, three quarters, a full. So you do titrate. What? You do titrate it along. I mean, you make it... What's that called? Meaning you make it... You, you don't make it as difficult oh, no, to begin no, yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a real going up to it. But you need to know where you are in space. And it's amazing when all you're doing is pivoting right, left, change it up. Very few people can memorize that or even know where they are. So I look to see, do they know where they are? And then we start slamming into the ground from uh, pretty close to the ground. <laughs> Did you want to try that? No, I, 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 afterwards. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and so how long does it take, you know, like Alvin Ailey, there's Ailey and there's Ailey 2. Yeah. Is it like Streb and Streb 2? I mean... No, I don't, my, my budget's a little smaller than Ailey. It, so, so how long does it take to get, like, they, they're on... At least two years. I don't put them, for instance, they don't get in with the I-beam at the beginning. You know, they can slam into a wall and not hurt anyone. They also, we can't have soloists. So gymnasts are soloists, circus people, mostly soloists except for the tumblers. So we have to have people that know where they are when nine other people are yeah. going around really rapidly. So they have this consciousness of everything. Um, and they also have to have this fast twitch muscle, which, which is something I was going to, I know they're bigger muscles, which I learned from your book. They're bigger. Or maybe it was Wikipedia that I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was just, and I was thinking, so they have to be able to really get out of the way and move before the problem exists. And really, I was wondering from you, I know that doesn't totally answer the question, because one, I'm not an educator and I, in a certain way, um, Cassandra Joseph, my associate director, deals with that in curricula. I just want them to be able to do it, so I'm not a great person. No, but practice, I mean, y you know, you're talking about Alex sort of learning all the moves. Oh, yeah. And I think one of the things that we, we've discovering, because sort of, we're interested in the science of practice, is how much what you do when you're good is offline. I mean, chess players, when you talk to grandmasters, they will say that most of the time when they're playing, they're offline, meaning that many, many, many of their skills are cached and they simply just retrieve them when wow. they see. And that doesn't mean they're not thinking, it's just they're reserving thinking for something much more stratospheric and the rest is all cached. And, and Alex Hunnell, because of his notebooks, those movements had already happened before he was up there. Yeah. He, had, he really had sort of just, he pressed some sort of button and it automated, yeah. which is I incredible. And, and it must be the case here that you sort of automate so that you're no longer thinking, I'm falling, you, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the forces. When you're dealing with forces that a normal walking body never encounters, falling people encounter. And the irony and I think the beauty and the profundity of movement really is if you just trip on a banana pillar, you trip on a curb and you're down and you get up and you look back and you're thinking, you don't even remember exactly how it happened, which I think is, magical somehow yeah but I but I do think it has to be intuitive and it has to be reflexive I don't know if I'm using that word incorrectly most people use the word reflex you know it's, it's a very complicated word you know it's, it, but it is that I mean I think there, there's a whole sequence of, of of movements you make I mean when I fall over on a banana peel or on ice the first thing I do is to check if anyone saw <laughs> oh, is that what they're doing when they look back it's a humiliation yeah poster. so I mean you, you mentioned um, the uh, the wild animal thing, which yeah. is really interesting, because you know that is what we're doing, right? We're trying to really? basically create physics engines that make you turn into an animal. So we, you know, we've done a dolphin. We're now working on a little dragon. We make people with their hand become a jellyfish. We very much want people to discover their movement repertoire by being projected into a wild animal space. So I think that's really, really fascinating what you're saying. And then there's also this. I don't know if you re remember. In the last couple of years, there have been these two books that were published. One by uh, a privileged Oxford professor um, about Going into the woods to be a wild animal, uh, you know, the, 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 the basically, um, yeah, d said, I'm going to, I can't remember, maybe somebody mm -hmm. in the audience can, but basically what he did is he was going to live in the umwelt, as it's called, of the animal. So he and his son got on all fours and basically sniffed around like badgers. And so in other words, they literally, and another one wanted to be a goat, 
right? So in, in other words, and it's very interesting that something happened to them by being forced into the umwelt through movement of another animal. And it seems like what you're saying, you've discovered this too, that by making these extreme actions, making movements that you don't usually make or you avoid making in these scenarios, you're doing just like they claimed in these books, that you're moving into the universe of a wilder side of you. I think, I think that that would be accurate. And, and I'm thinking like what you, what you, if you think, it also has to do with where you think the subject of action is. And I believe that, I mean, I have to have a dialectic with someone in its dance since I'm recognized in the dance world. But even though dance doesn't desire to have a dialectic with me, but I talk to them all the time anyway. Um, but for instance, if you think the subject, and I'm sure you organized where the subject of your inquiry has to be so that you can get to the bottom of uh, discoveries that would then add up to maybe new vocabulary, new ways of thinking, and new solutions. But for, for us, I, I, I all of a sudden realize, oh, it's not the body that is the subject, because when you look at a body, it's not that interesting. I mean, I know you go inside the body, and maybe it's more interesting in there. But out here, I know exactly what you're going to do. And as a theatrical phenomenon, you cannot surprise me. And I'm not surprised or impressed by skill, because I know that's acquired. And so I realized, OK, the body is not the object um, or the subject, but action is the subject, and not in how it happens and where you are and what you're doing, not body-wise, but, um, but, but spatially and the forces that you encounter. And those are invisible things. You can't name them. And no one has built a nomenclature around the invisible moves as you are in space and time. But so, so what, what I wanted to say, what I wanted to, to say specifically about that is that if you are up, let's say, 20 feet, you're standing on a truss that we have at SLAM, 20 feet high, and about five or maybe even eight years ago, we were just falling off. That's how far we had gotten, falling off from a height. And I asked the dancers, well, on the way down, will you try a few moves? On the way down, since you've got that time. And maybe it was only, <laughs> you got some extra time, do some moves. And they, and also when you're falling or flying, you're always parabolically. It's a parabolic yeah. thing. Um, and so they really couldn't do it. You know, they, you have to land flat on your stomach or back to spread out the weight when you're going from a height. They couldn't do it. And then we started a piece uh, for the Armory first in 2011 and for the Olympics in 2012 called Human Fountain, where 33 people were diving off from 30 feet to 15 feet to 10 feet. And all of a sudden, it was like the uh, 100 mon monkey phenomenon. Yeah. You know? Um, and they started doing, like, tours. And they started doing, like, jackknives and opening up and landing on their back and moves on the way down. And I just thought about that 100th monkey that after 100 years or 100th monkey, you don't have to teach them to wash their fruit anymore. I don't remember exactly what it was. Yes. Is that it? Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's something like that. But I mean, it's a, <laughs> um, I, 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 you I know what, That's just all of a sudden the word was in the air and they decided. Sure. So the, idea, so the idea is, right, and I think people talk a lot about this, is that it's not that you don't already know how to do it. It's just you're not expressing it. And then the moment comes and they do it, right? And it's like an aha moment where, yeah. why did now? Why did why right now? now, right? The four minute mile, why yeah, now? Why now, right? And I, and I, and I think that's, that's really interesting. And I think, you know, there are some very recent experiments um, in, in uh, a very interesting experiment recently in the rodent, where they have the rodent practicing something they still can get better, and they're not, but they're expressing their learning at only about 50%. And then you take away the possibility of doing any more learning, and suddenly they're at 100%. Right? Well, it's, like, it's, do it's, you it, stop their, it, their pressing device? It, 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 you, you, yes, you basically take away a reward. So, okay. so it's sort of like seemingly instantaneously, <laughs> they're expressing a level of skill that wasn't apparent. <laughs> Previously, right? It, it seemed to come out of nowhere, but obviously it hasn't come out of nowhere. It, it, there must have been, it's latently there, and you're practicing, but you're not showing it, and then suddenly it's expressing it. It, it, it is it's, incredible. It's, it's belligerent. It's another reason to add to the reasons I can't stand rats. Yeah. Uh, it may have even been a mouse. Would that make it any better? Slightly. But yeah. they still move with a rhythm. 
that is terrifying. And I don't know how rhythms are terrifying or, but, but that's, but what do you, what do you attribute that to? No, I, I, well, I mean, I, 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 I think people are now just beginning to speculate what it, that there's a, a phase of rehearsal and a phase of performance. Mm -hmm. And maybe people implicitly still think they're rehearsing. Then the moment comes time now for performance. Yeah. And you suddenly have a jump in the quality of your performance. The other thing I was thinking about people falling, I don't know if you know that David Eagleman, he's a neuroscientist who has now has a TV show. And, and, but he did some experiments because everyone thought that when you're under intense danger or stress, that time slows down. Right? And maybe if you become really good at doing what your dancers are doing, that they just suddenly, like, you know, bionic man or Spider-Man, things go more slowly, like in the Matrix, right? Um, so they did an experiment sort of with stopwatches and sense of time and found that, in fact, time does not slow down um, when you're, you know, your life doesn't fly in front of you when you're in danger. It's interesting, right? It turns out not to be true. It's very interesting, but, it, but for instance, if you're just falling, and it's maybe perceptual, or you're falling and doing a ball and out, tur land, turns, land. More things are happening. So you perceive that time is going faster because there are just more occurrences within the same time span. It seems to go faster. And your body does have to move faster to accomplish those X, Y, Z things. Yeah. But I, think, I do think it's, I mean, I, I, my, my, I mean, the whole thing about the past present and the future is, you know, I never deal with regret or, or hope. We stay here. But I always think that there's um, some relationship a human has with time that is completely complex. And it is about what is it you're noticing? You know, and I think my project has to do with I'm trying to get the audience to notice something that's euphoric and that they've never seen, and whether it's heroism of the human body, the way Alex did that thing, um, and, or it, whether it's a surprise. Can you surprise people who are looking at an event that they know it's... I think that's really important. I mean, there's, there are theories of the brain now. Um, like, there's a very famous neuroscientist called Carl Friston who has what he's calling his free energy principle for how the brain works. And basically, it's the hunting down and compressing of surprise. Really? Right, yes, that you're basically, and, and then there's another person's theory, which is you want to move down a gradient towards always being at a point where you can have the greatest repertoire of actions. That's so beautiful. Yes, yeah, so there are, in fact, theories that are close to sort of what you're intuiting. And then this idea of things that are sufficiently surprising that you're forced to be in the present. I mean, Milan Kundera, in one of his novels, Immortality, has this great essay called Imagology, where he talks about people doing things, and even as they're doing them, they're imagining talking about them at the cocktail party when they get back. <laughs> right, so in other words, they're, they're already enjoying the memory of the thing that's currently happening, right, which is a little bit what selfies are and photographs, you know. Um, and so you, it, it's a nice idea that you want things so surprising, so intense, that you cannot be anywhere other than in the present, which is, I think, sort of what you're saying, which I, I really like. But if they're thinking about the dinner party, are they really in the... No, 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 that's what I'm saying. You have to, that's why you have to you're give You're not them, doing that. You're not doing that, okay, right? Okay. And most things... I was worried for a minute. Yeah, no, I think it's like... You know, I, I feel that way when I watch people at classical music concerts. I know most of them are daydreaming. Of course. Right? And every now and then they'll drift back in and listen. Or right? wake up. Or wake up. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. Um, so what's next before we well, open it up for questions? I mean, what, 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 I mean you, do, you have to, do you feel like you have to keep upping yourself? I mean, what next? Well, I, I, don't, I don't really know what next because usually the questions are, I mean, it's, it's a heuristic form. So I try and notice what surprised me in our experiments. Um, we have something now in the space called a Molinet, and it was designed by Noe España, a fifth generation Mexican circus family. And it's an event that his mom did in the 50s. And it's on a swivel pole. But we have three people on a swivel pole. So, so it's, what's a swivel pole exactly? A swivel pole is, um, well, it's a prototype. But it's manufactured by estimating uh, the amount of force that's going to be provided by this, the diameter of the, of the actual pipe. And it's up about 15 feet in the air. And it has, it, it's probably about um, 15 feet um, in length. 
and then off the ends of the length of these almost Louise Bourgeois spider legs mm -hmm. that hold it up there. And the dancers put special boots on that have these little pegs that come out of them in a knob on the end of the peg. And they climb up, and there's a hole you put the peg in, slide it in, put the peg in, slide it in. And you cannot separate your legs because you'll come out the hole. And, and what you do is you fall, and you come around and back up. Wow. And, and I, I, I... I think I'm going to have a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't really fall, you yeah. rotate, right? You rotate, and I had this, and this happens to me a number of times, I have the drawing that the engineer, or this, I even had a, a theater person from New Orleans or an eight-year-old child say, why don't you do this next? Because we're always open to the public and you're always invited. So I finally, I thought, well, they're stuck there, and so what can I do? You, know, you can't go anywhere, you know, go anywhere, as if traveling is that fascinating. Um, <laughs> and so I decided to go ahead and press the button and my, you know, uh, uh, executive directors, you know, Susan Myers and Kathy Einhorn decided we can afford it, you know, they usually cost about, I don't know, thirty five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to get these big equipments in. So anyway, the, the interesting part about this is I was going to just demonstrate unison, I mean pure unison and pure canon, because in my opinion, in my opinion, they're the only two timing systems that read physically. If you remember the uh, Chinese Olympics, the 2,000 people they had in unison. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, yeah. When I saw that, I'm like, oh, whoa. And this thing about musical timing, when dancers are saying, A, B, A, B, C, A, C, B, no. That's just <laughs> fiddling around. You don't see it physically. It's oral or it's visual. So this machine that I can't let any of you try, and you probably wouldn't want to, John. No, 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 no. I, 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 an iPhone is about my experience. An iPhone. <laughs> but it's so beautiful because we've learned all these things you can do. You can do porta bras, which I find very annoying on the ground. You can slightly plie and accelerate. I mean, really accelerate. So you basically are saying that in this contraption, for you, ballet has become nice to watch again. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's a mean question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it seems, it seems cool. You know, if you can techno it up, it becomes interesting again. Well, well I think also if you're going to talk about content, physical content, slash meaning. I mean, meaning is a sign from the outside, and my discovery has always been what's the content of action? What can it do that no other discipline can do? That would be the job of any either artist or scientist to ascertain you know, I've got to get to content, and then the, the, the meaning assignment is not my job. So I think that this, uh -huh. this, is, this is my, my and exploration. It, and, it was in your, and, and then my last question to you before you open it up, there's, there was an interesting thing in the New Yorker article um, where you wanted to use those cannon piston things. The air rams. The air rams. Uh -oh. The air rams. And I love it where you casually say, yeah, I want them to be fired, <laughs> and then I want them to catch on fire, and then I want to yeah. jowls out the fire. Did you ever do that, or was it just an idea? Did you shoot them out, turn them on fire, put them on fire, and then put it out? <laughs> I shot them out. I did not turn them on fire. But I thought it would be a great idea if I could do that. Because your fire is very interesting to you, yeah. right? You know, I, I, I was thinking of a little anecdote for you that I thought you'd like, that um, Jean Cocteau, the, the, the French playwright and filmmaker and poet, um, used to give people tours of his apartment in Paris. And one day, uh, a, a, a tourist asked him, you know, if your apartment were to catch fire, what would you rescue? What would you take with you, I should say? He said, Madame, I would take the fire. <laughs> <laughs> that's so Isn't that good. great? Yeah, that's so yes. good. Right. Okay, I think we should uh, start taking questions, if, if that's possible. I don't know where Tim is. Yes. You've heard um, how Elizabeth reacts to mean questions. <laughs> they were not mean that questions. That doesn't say you shouldn't ask one if I you so choose, you. but make them also <laughs> meaningful and preferably also quite brief so we can accommodate as many as possible for both Elizabeth and for John. Um, for those of you joining us um, on Facebook Live, this is a Rubin Museum of Art's Brainwave series with Professor John Krakow and Ms. Elizabeth Streb. Extreme action artist meets neuroscientist engaging on extreme action, movement, 
and where the brain fits into this all. Fire and fear, two themes that have come up in this conversation, which are combined in an emanation on the second floor of this museum dedicated to Himalayan art, and she's known as the Green Tara. And she is a protectress against the eight fears. And the eight fears, well, I won't go into all of them, but the first one is being trampled by wild elephants, which can happen to you if you're a commuter in the New York uh, subway system um, on a regular basis. But one of them is also the fear of being consumed by fire. And the thing to note in the sort of subtext of the Green Tower is that, no, she doesn't stop you from being consumed by flames or being trampled. That's not her job. Her job is to alleviate you from the fear of such happening because it's the fear that allows you to be consumed or to be trampled because you hadn't had the understanding of how everything connects in order for you to avoid that if possible. And it's that psychology at work at the heart of um, this emanation of Tibetan Buddhism that's a really fascinating one and how it folds into this conversation. So um, after this, I urge you to go up um, to the floors and explore a little more deeply about um, that relationship because that's what this museum likes to do. Um, we also like to entertain your questions. So anybody like to give it a crack? Hands up goes first. All right, so we're well, ending now. Um, <laughs> Could I say one thing while you're waiting for someone to raise their hands? We, I had a, we have fantasy dances, and one was of an elephant when Ken Feld, who owned the Barnum and Bailey Circus, et cetera, Ringling Brothers, said what you're missing in your show <clears throat> are small people and elephants, so I made an elephant dance, <laughs> and fire. So I, I never knew those eight fears. I better go find out what the other six are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a tutorial afterwards, Elizabeth. Okay. That'll be fun. Yes, front row. Thank you so much. All right. Um, for Elizabeth, I, I really like the idea of relabeling pain as a, a foreign sensation to be curious about. Uh, but how do you address the objective reality that falling on your face hurts? Um, can you tell, talk to us about the, uh, the mental conditioning that you put your dancers through? Well, um, if you keep your body completely aligned, and you can do that by watching someone standing sideways, their chest and their thighs are going to hit before their face does, unless you stick your head out. So that's the first thing I would say. If you had a proper technique and you were falling, are you speaking about falling accidentally? Well, just with that sentence, it's an attitude of mind and spirit and soul and mind curiosity. I can do that. I mean, it really adds to the empowerment of a human when you fall on your face and you land flat and you realize what a beautiful sound it makes. <laughs> Especially, originally, we didn't use mats till the 90s, and I started this in the late 80s. The dancers asked for a little baby. We were doing head chenets. And they wanted a little baby mat or wear hat. And, and, that, and, that, and now the mats are like ridiculous. So, <laughs> And I guess I don't, I mean, that is part of, you could come to a slam and take a pop action class. And I, I don't teach, but um, I'm bossy. And I could show you how anyone who is, that's not really painful, that move. You just get used, I guess you just get used to it. And you feel more empowered. Like I fell on my face today, ha ha. Yeah. And I will say it comes in useful in your everyday life when you're out on the street. We had someone write to us after, after, after an audition and they said a car came at me and I didn't have time to get out of the way. It was I didn't pay attention and they jumped up. You can do a hike jump and then ran across the hood and off the other side. <laughs> Next question. Elizabeth, you had a recent, fairly recent commission in London, and could you talk a little bit about that commission, and were there extra special challenges or risks that you had not had before, and what did you learn from that? Well, um, I think Jackie's referring to the Bloomberg building, the Norman Foster building in London, mm -hmm. 
uh, and it was a private commission, and uh, he wanted us to do something special for the opening of this amazing building. Uh, so I decided to, the, it happened, the, the main thing, the main event happened on the sixth floor. It was a banquet for maybe 350 of the most VVVVVIP humans on earth, <laughs> which counted me out, but I sat at that table anyway. Nonsense. Nonsense. Right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Michael Bloomberg and I have a really great and relationship of sorts. And so I decided, <laughs> it, this banquet is right here, 350 people, and which I'm looking at you as if you're the outside, and it was a curved thing, and there is St. Paul's Cathedral. And so my rigger, Robin Elias, rigged three beautiful, gorgeous points, three points from the roof of that building. And it's 110 stories high, no, 110 feet high, something like that. And uh, he, he rigged my dancers on the ground and uh, onto these high-speed winches. And um, <clears throat> they went, at the end of the meal, at the end of dessert, there had been, you know, their Broadway, Singing in the Rain performances and the London Orchestra performances and then come Streb. And we, uh, I, I used a, a Lark Ascends, Lark Ascends, it's a, com it's, a, it's a classical piece. And the dancers, all of a sudden, they, all the audience was talking, they weren't an audience, they didn't know what was gonna happen, so the dancers just came up in front of the window while they were e having their last spoon of dessert and then went down and up and they were doing all these things and I was standing there and, I mean, the fact of the matter was, all I was thinking of is, you can only go down as fast as gravity, 32 feet per second, but you squared, but you can come up much faster. And all I was praying, was for was that none of those cables broke. That's all I was thinking about. And I think I think that mm. when I'm watching any of the work that Streb does, and actually the night before at a dinner in the Picasso Museum in Paris, Bloomberg was sitting across from me and he looked at me and he goes, don't fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I looked right back at him and I said, I won't. But I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my partner, Laura. I didn't tell my rigor. You know. Anyway, it's, it's nerve-wracking. Uh, yes, here. Thank you. Hi, I'm interested in the, the conversation that you started earlier about time and fear and being in the present moment. Um, and I wonder if John could speak a little bit to the fact that fe fear seems to me like to be a future experience. You're anticipating an anxiety. Um, and to live in the present moment might be to not experience mm. that if you really were. And I wondered if you could speak to the actual science about that. I don't think I really can. I don't want to. Bl I mean, I, I think I see what you mean. I mean, people have always said that, right? That it's fear is anticipation, right? And, uh, you know, I, 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 another one is, you know, I think Flaubert was the one who said, you know, you, you rush up the stairs of excitement only to burst into the empty attic of disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I think that there is something to that. I mean, a little bit that Kundera was saying, that you, you, you spend a lot of time projecting. So maybe if you are concentrating very hard on what you're doing, I mean, sports, you know, athletes say this all the time, if you're in the middle of a match or a game and you're already thinking about winning or losing, you're already off your mission. And so I, I think it must be true that if you are in what Chicks Hand Me High calls flow, which we haven't talked about, you know, this notion that you're in this flow state, and, and one of the definitions of this flow state is that you really are not thinking in future or past. <coughs> you're locked into present. And my guess is if you're in flow, and there's a lot of work on flow, some of it's a bit hokey, to be honest, but uh, I think it's real, uh, if you are in flow, that means you're not anticipating, and maybe you're not in a state of fear. I mean, I think Alex Honnold in Free Solo, there's a point in the, where he talks about that, that you're so concentrating that you don't even have time to be afraid. So that's probably true, right? But I try and avoid those situations. <laughs> well, uh, fearing to go back into the past, but last brainwave was all about time. And David Eagleman was uh, a featured speaker in a number of those sessions. And those recordings are on our media site. 
Um, so if you want to explore a little more of those notions, you can, um, and you'll be welcome to uh, join us virtually that way. Let's take a question from the back, because I know there were a few hands uh, up earlier. Uh, yes, that gentleman there. Thank you, Zadie. I have a, um, I guess it's kind of a fetish for angular momentum and spinning, and I'm, I made a platform that you can stand on. It's slightly tilted by shifting your weight. I can, I can spin really fast, 60 RPM or more for hours at a time. But when I first started, the nausea was intense. And I think that nausea is a survival mechanism of the brain saying that it, it, when it can't compile the various data feeds into a, into a contiguous experience of reality. reality. It says knock it off, and I think that's what the nausea is. And I'm also wondering about vestibular proprioceptive and um, visual components of balance and switching between them when changing states between angular and linear momentum. Do you? Well, are you the weeble wobble guy? Not that I know of. <laughs> what's, I'm, I, cu I'm curious, what's the diameter of you, the Ford? 15 inches. Yeah. And that's why you can get 60 RPMs? Cause that's, sure. Are you I saying know, that I'm, per I'm, minute, you, I, you go around a minute a second? I mean, a, 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 a rotation a second? Isn't that 60 RPMs? Yeah. Again, and it's, yes, it is a fundamentally different experience of gravity mm -hmm. and reality when gravity becomes a donut pulling you outward. Yeah. Um, well, that's, I like the speed of that. Um, <laughs> but I know that we, ha we did turning surfaces, one thing called artificial gravity, because I think that's what centripetal force is sometimes referred to as. And the, we had an eight-foot disk, and it was one RPM. One, it went, would go around one rotation, eight feet, and if it's two, two, point, two pi r, uh, that, then you get the circumference as, is it 25 feet? Two times... 25 something but there, therefore you're able to occupy like running across the stage which was one of my attractions to this you know you've got maybe 50 feet maybe 25 and so by the time you get over there you've got to stop and turn and come back but if you're turning you can reach maximum speed at least what the human can handle and I think that uh, when I got to the 20 foot disc which was a donut around the 8 foot disc I didn't have a motor fast enough to turn it at that rate mm -hmm. and it became less interesting but we would trade back and forth on the turning, and you could go forward, walking, stay in one place, walking. It was a fascinating equipment. But anyway, I'm not sure if you only have 15 inches across, um, you're having your experience as a human sitting there and doing 60 RPMs. Uh, I'm not sure what the question was. I, I, for me, that would be a, a ride, not a, a show. It would be happening to you only, the person doing it. And my projection is, I am interested in acceleration, and I don't know if you, like, that's what those air rams were. You stepped on it, and you got flung 20 feet. And it was not pretty dangerous, like instant acceleration. That's not exactly what you're talking about. Then. No, I'm talking about uh, spinning 60 RPM and coming to an abrupt stop and not falling down. John, I think that might be your... You know, I mean, it's, it, I, I, there's a huge amount of really interesting work done in, you know, spinning rooms, studying Coriolis forces. I actually, believe it or not, um, reviewed uh, the Mars mission for three years for, for, mm -hmm. for NASA, and, would, and, and they were very interested in these kinds of questions about can you adapt? The, the nausea, for example, I, mean, I don't study nausea, I'm not a vestibular person, but the idea of mismatch is being questioned now as the, be, as the mechanism for, for nausea, actually. Um, yeah, well, that was what people always said, right? That you, when you have mismatch between what your vestibular system is saying, what your visual system is saying, you know, don't read in a car, for example, you get nauseated. Um, but what I don't know, and I maybe I have to look it up, I'm gonna, is, is whether you can begin to, I mean, people do get their sea legs, for example. I mean, it's very, people are on a ship, they get very nauseated and over day. So we know you can adapt your nausea response, right? So. Uh, that, that's absolutely clear, and that's true for astronauts as well. So um, how exactly you adapt your nausea response is not something maybe people have looked at that. I, I don't know the answer, but yes. So it must be true that even in those extremes, perhaps you can begin to damp down that response. 
because we know it happens with, with people who go to sea and, and astronauts. Uh, I just, I just, it's not something I study. I'm not going <coughs> to. Thank you. Next question. And we probably have time for maybe three total, so uh, make them count. Thank you. Thanks. This is for uh, Elizabeth. Yeah. Where <coughs> are you? I can't see you. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that you hold the element of surprise as the highest virtue that you seek. And uh, so my question is, one, how do you define the element of surprise or how do you find surprise? Mm -hmm. And two, from your experience, what are the things that usually we have to re-educate ourselves in order to be able to get there? Because I think a lot of people want that, they understand that, but there's such entrenched inhibitions to deal with, even if you understand that it's important. Yeah, th thank you. That's a great question. Um, it's, it's more not surprise. It's my question about what's the iambic pentameter of action. And, and there's all these reasons why Shakespeare wrote an iambic pentameter. And, and Laura, my partner, Laura Flounder, who's a journalist, was reading to me from um, the poet Mary Oliver. And it was in her form poetry book. And she was talking about uh, the English language had a certain breath capacity and the natural place to pause and stop as you were reading it. And I thought, well, what, what's Action's version of that? And what, what's the, it's not so much surprise, because, you know, humans, I know humans that, uh, never mind. Um, it's hard to surprise everybody. It's not surprise. It's like, I want you to cry when you see a move that's similar to a singer hitting a high C. That's neurological. That's human. That's not, I'm trying to locate those places, those trajectories that we can create a rhythm that's physical that will take your breath away. And, and surprises really, because I don't think, one time we, we performed with Cirque du Soleil in Montreal at their 20th anniversary. They've never really asked me to do more than that, but I was analyzing the difference between the grammar of circus and the grammar of Streb, because we were just in their show. And I thought that when Streb came on, the whole 200,000 people would go, oh, bummer, what's that? Because they would notice that it was art and be really upset, you know. <laughs> Um, but they weren't, they didn't even notice. But my real inquiry is about what's the true and actual grammar of motion? Yes. <clears throat> Your um, dancers are in incredible shape, of course, and, and extraordinary. And I'm wondering, how long do they last? Uh, have, you had, have you had dancers with you for a decade, for example? Yeah. Wow. That's and I've been here for 40 years. Yeah, but, yeah. but I'm not doing those things anymore. Yeah. The longest was 14 years, and now it's 10. Uh, Cassandra's 11. She's the associate artistic director, and I have a 10, and I have a 9 and a half. And it's really, it's, it's not your body that gives out. It's your spirit and your mind yeah. that decides not to spend three hours a day Sounds training. Sounds like academia. <laughs> it does. Well, tell me. John, tell me. <laughs> No, but you have such a beautiful, I mean, w when you think about it, you have information that you're, that you're, that you're, that you're generating that people really want to know, and it'll help the world. I have to talk the world into thinking that <laughs> you're going to want me, this. it's the same for me, oh, too. No, but you have, he had one sentence, and I just want to get, it's so beautiful, and tell me this is from your book, and I wasn't thinking of something else. Uh, I, I'm going to say, if it's beautiful, I'll get Except credit for it. Okay. It said, the future of stroke recovery will require that we give humans wings. Yes, that's us. And when I read that, I thought, we are yeah, no, not no. born at the same time, but maybe from the same zygote or some like, <laughs> like <the> odd thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really chuffed. That's at the end of the book as well. So uh, I was you must have read it or just skipped to the end. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Index wings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, how would I have known? Right, the thought. <coughs> uh, talk about your work in rehabilitation, John. I think people need to know. Oh, really? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> no, but no, it, and it's actually you know we are also obsessed with movement, and one of the things that we feel uh, the elderly, the injured, and the neurologically impaired don't get is the opportunity to safely do a lot of exploratory, motivated, intense movement. Uh, the idea is that you have to be kept safe, you mustn't fall, and so we lose the opportunity to sort of provide doses and intensities of, of movement 
to get people better again. And what we thought is that the way to do that is to immerse people in an animalistic kind of world uh, where you can explore movements and go a bit crazy, go a bit wild, and not feel ashamed. Because, you know, one of the things I always say is if you're going to be sick, you might as well enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and we somehow, in medicine, don't want you to have a wild thrill ride uh, after you've had an injury or a brain disease, and we're trying to counter that. And we absolutely feel, just so you know, and this is why I think we do resonate fundamentally, is that movement isn't just about movement. It has metaphysical and psychological profound effects. And we now know that exercise and complex movements are far better for cognitive health than, for example, playing brain games. Right? So in other words, in some, we're down doing a study at Hopkins where we're having people, um, if it's true, I, I don't know if this is going to be true, but they're playing with their arms with an animal in order to improve their executive function so that they then can walk better. So in other words, you're getting to walking via cognition, via a safer form of movement therapy. So there's a very complex interaction between movements and exercise and cognition that we're only beginning to understand. And I, my belief is that when you go and see Streb or any other dance performance, you're enjoying it cognitively because of that intimate link. And, we, and, we, and we've, in the West, we're kind of a little bit, especially sort of the northern hygienic nations, the Anglo-American world, um, <laughs> we're sort of a bit dead from the neck down. And I think it's very important to get the body back in contact with the mind. And I think movement is the way to do that. And that's what our rehabilitation yeah. is trying to do. Yeah. Thank you. Our final question. Yes. So this is a question for either or both of you. Is it your opinion that children are naturally not fearful of movement and they are taught to be fearful of movement? Stop running. You know, the, if we left them alone, they would be freer to take movement risks. John, what do you think about <laughs> that? <laughs> Both are true, right? In other words, there are three things. One is, I, 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 you know, it's been a mystery for a long time. There's this um, belief that children learn better than adults. Okay? Um, in one way, that's true just because there's this notion of critical periods. In another way, it's true just because if you start younger, you've gone for longer. All right? um, but we still don't really know if it's true that somebody who's, let's say, 15 learns better than somebody who's 55. All right. But what I do think is true, a number of things. One is that there are fear, in, innate fear mechanisms. I mean, I don't know if you've seen those YouTube videos when they put a cucumber behind a cat, <laughs> and the cat looks behind it. <laughs> like this, right? So in other words, you've got these, it's extraordinary. I mean, you can't stop laughing at this sort of terror of a cucumber. Right? <laughs> So there are no doubt that ch young children have their equivalent of cucumber responses. <laughs> okay, they do. Uh, they nevertheless do take more risks, yes. And also I think that risk taking is probably related to what I think is really going on, is that they're willing to explore for lower net reward. In other words, failure isn't so devastating as you're trying. You know, I was just skiing again. You know, I used to ski when I was, I was, I was known as the flying daffodil. I was <laughs> my, my yellow outfit. Oh, sure, oh, <laughs> yes. sure. Yeah. But, but what I noticed is I was watching kids trying to do well, and they were falling, and they were falling, and they were taking risks, and they were doing dangerous things. And that, I think, is what's different between children and adults. And we did some preliminary experiments back at Columbia over 10 years ago. We tried to see whether it was true that you were willing to fail more as a child mm -hmm. than as an adult. That's what I suspect. But as a lot of this is sort of assumed, but it's very difficult to study because you have to control for time spent on the task. Right? And it's very hard to do that. And then also control for control difficulties as you get older, which confound the study of your ability to learn. Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, and, and Beckett said, and the fail, yeah. fail again, fail better. And I think one of the issues with the dance world is when you're a young, unknown artist, you just constantly fail. You know, you constantly fail. And you, 
go ahead, do it, and then you learn, you know, with all the bad reviews, not that they know what you're doing necessarily, but it's, it's the, le it's the, if you can't maintain your appetite for failure ongoingly and even have it increase as you get to a place where you have a reputation and you think you know what you're doing, that's dangerous waters. You have to just keep going into the failure zone. And I think one of the problems of the, the dance world, since I like to hit on the dance world, is that there's just no time for that unless you decide you're gonna pay for it, you decide you've got a room you can move in, you decide um, I'm gonna shift this around and I'm gonna be the master of my ship or the mistress of my ship. And I'm going to be willing to keep failing because that's how I learned when I was younger and that was where the surprise factor came in. But once you start just rearranging the bits you've unearthed, it just is nothing. I, I think really. that's really fundamental. I mean, there's a wonderful line, I was just reading a novel, that, uh, a French novel, Last year, there's a wonderful line in there um, when, you, when the, one of the protagonists says, everyone at some point in their lives starts to repeat themselves. <laughs> and that's what you have to well, I know, it's, it's tragic, isn't it? Yes, um, and so uh, I, I think that's what, the, you know, I think adults begin to get comfortable repeating themselves and then stop exploring and failing and children are less willing to repeat themselves. And do you speak French too? Uh, I, no, I, I, I really don't. I used I to be much better, and, and now I, it, it's turned into other languages. But you re read French? I did it quite a lot. See? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop, what do you say? Intimidating, <laughs> it's intimidating. <laughs> no, I'm just... in French, John. <laughs> I don't know, when you're brought up in the working class, all you hear is English until you go to a state school, and then you hear more English. <laughs> And that's my excuse for only speaking broken English, actually. Yes, actually, can I just, just to speak to that, I mean, I don't know if you've read Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me, no. but it's really a wonderful book, and it starts with him as a kid in Baltimore, you know, inner city black kid, being taught French, and, he, and saying, why am I being taught French? I might as well be being taught Klingon, right? <laughs> and, um, and then the book, at the end of the book, it's very moving, I mean, I'll sort of tears, where he goes to be a correspondent in Paris for the New Yorker, I believe. And so he was teaching himself French. And he's in a restaurant in Paris, and he's determined to use his newly acquired French, right? And the waitress, um, who clearly is probably completely fluent in English, takes him completely seriously and <laughs> makes him order in French, right? And, and, and he does, and he succeeds. And it's incredibly moving because you can learn French at any time. But yeah, but then, yeah, but then, yeah, but then the end of that story is he gets a toad for dinner. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> you didn't say that part. Sean. So, well, to quote uh, an author that um, John has already referenced uh, in this conversation today. Uh, See, seeing life as a constant series of disappointments when you reach the attic, Gustave Flaubert wrote to Jean Sans, um, lamenting, life is so expensive. <laughs> and he's right, and so is running a museum. And uh, so... <laughs> so is what? What did he say? <laughs> no, I know where you think this is going, and that's not where it's going. Um, this is just an expression of gratitude to those people who see merit in what we're doing and are supporting it. And Brainwave has seen a number of these great individuals. Noah P. Dorsky is a trustee of, of ours who has become the sort of lead sponsor of the series. I mean, there are 24 programs, so what's not to love? But also Cheryl Henson is one of those. Thank you, Cheryl, so much for your support. And what Cheryl does is remarkable. Um, she has long been an advocate of um, really introducing puppetry as theater to New York audiences with a puppetry festival. She's now championing um, a really interesting performance called Chimpanzee, which starts at here on March the 8th, which in relationship to movement is so interesting because it's a, it's a depiction of a chimpanzee manipulated by uh, puppeteers who um, has been trained in a human environment and not in the wild. 
and the lessons and the unlearning of those lessons that it has to undergo in order to find meaning. And so I do urge you to check it out at here, um, not here, at here, uh, starting March the 8th. So uh, do check that out. But also, it's so funny, Elizabeth, um, forgive my humor at this, uh, that, that um, it, you, you take stabs at the dance world. Uh, but they, they've, they've actually embraced you on this level at least because, of course, the Joyce Theatre has kindly and generously co-presented this particular Sorry. program. And I love the Joyce Theatre. I love everyone. the Joyce Theatre. Um, so those of you who heard about this program from the Joyce, thank you so much. And those of you who can bear to go to dance theatre, um, there is a brochure of the Joyce's programs. They're just a block away on... Um, uh, uh, 8th Avenue and 18th Street, so, uh, so check out their, their series as well. But um, the way we'd like to thank you two uh, is in a, I guess, um, Ruben way, which is very small, <laughs> but uh, it, I hopefully, will be meaningful because we've talked a lot about fear this afternoon and how the power of fear can hold us back from doing what we might well have potential to do, we just haven't taken that playful, daring, whatever risk it is. And the elephant in the room, I suppose, of this fear is actually dispelled in Himalayan and Indic understanding by the representation of the elephant god Ganesh, who is the remover of obstacles, mm -hmm. one of which, of course, is Fear, ignorance, all those sorts of things. He comes in, I'm afraid, Elizabeth, he rides in from the dark on the back of a mouse, a rodent. Can you bear it? <laughs> and with these weird, freaky movements that they make, <laughs> scuffling along the ground. But this giant elephant rides on the back of a small rodent into the light. And that light is awareness. And that is what we hope this series will help bring to you of what is possible. And that, oh, we can not only change our perception and our abilities by just thinking about them differently, we can also change society, which is something, folks, we need to do. So, on that note, given that, John, with your work and rehabilitation, you have removed obstacles for so many people who uh, who really didn't know that they had other options. Here is a little lapis Ganesh for you. Oh, Don't lose it. No, I love Ganesh. I'm there you go. God, All so right. Oh, that's so beautiful. Is you it can take him anywhere. Oh. <laughs> I'm a bit chuffed. <laughs> that's an English expression for quite pleased. <laughs> oh. oh. And <laughs> elephant. There's no fire and no mouse attached to this, Elizabeth, but here's your Ganesh too. And you have demonstrated so provocatively that, yeah, we can fly if we only put our minds to it and our bodies will follow. Elizabeth Streb, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.